So here we're starting in the Italian Proto-Renaissance or the 13th century or the Trecento. Although the medieval period did not focus on the art of classical antiquity, it was also not entirely absent. It did, however, take a classical revival in Italy in the 13th and 14th centuries for classical art to become a much more pervasive and long-lasting influence on art and architecture. And we're going to see a number of influences which will be key to the genesis of the Italian Renaissance. So I want to go through some of those. First, the most obvious and the most commonly cited, the Greek and Roman influence. Now, this is what we mean when we talk about classical art. It tends to be the art of ancient Greece and ancient Rome, really from about 500 BCE to 476 CE, roughly a thousand years, where we see that base of Western society, the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans. Now, there are other societies out there, but here we're focusing primarily on the West. And they're going to be finding these Greek and Roman statues. They're going to find them in Rome as they start to clean up the city. They're going to find them in Pompeii and other places. Usually what they're finding are Roman copies of the Greek originals. The Roman copies are frequently in marble, whereas many of, although not all, of the Greek originals were in bronze. There are other influences as well that I want to touch on. First, there's urbanism and trade. In Northern Europe at this time, in the 12th, 13th century, we see the, ad, or we see the continued use of the feudal system. And this is effectively slavery, where you're paying food rent to a landlord and you really don't have any ability to move. It's a heavily agricultural society. However, in Italy and along the Mediterranean, we see a much more urban society focusing on trade. Centers like Venice, Constantinople, Milan, Pisa, Rome, and Naples will be major trade hubs, and so their economies are very different. We see a middle class, although not massively large at this point, made up of merchants, tradesmen, craftsmen of a certain skill level. So this means that there's more money and more potential, especially in Italy, than, say, northern Europe in Belgium or the Netherlands or France. We're also going to see the sack of Constantinople in 1204. Now, this is not the fall of Constantinople. That will happen in 1453 when the Ottomans will conquer the Byzantine Empire for the last time. Here, this is the Fourth Crusade. They show up in Venice on their way to the Holy Lands, and the Venetians bribe them to destroy Constantinople. The Crusaders of the Fourth Crusade dutifully do this. And in doing so, they really destroy the economy of the Byzantine Empire and of Constantinople, which had been the primary center of trade for Europe for centuries. So what this does is it runs off all the artisans. They will go elsewhere to seek out money. And where are they going to do that? Italy. We also see the French Gothic. Now, we're all familiar with French Gothic cathedrals, for example, but here we're focusing on French Gothic sculpture, where they're moving from more modeled, conventional depictions of angels, saints, Jesus, and others, to more naturalistic approaches, where they're actually looking at a person and the clothing that they're wearing and how it naturally falls and how the figure would naturally appear. This is a huge shift, and is actually one of the reasons why many art historians today are starting to push the idea that the French Gothic is actually the start of the Renaissance, rather than anything happening in Italy. We also see Frederick II of Sicily, who's a major patron of the arts. And there's a number of reasons why he's going to do this. You patronize the arts not because you love the arts. I mean, maybe today that happens, but not back then. You're patronizing the arts because of a number of reasons. First of all, it looks good to the people you rule over because you're giving back to the society in the form of murals and sculptures. Secondly, and arguably more importantly, 
those sculptures and paintings, while they may seem fairly mundane, something like the creation of man, Adam and Eve, the David, they all act as propaganda, trying to get across a specific message. And it's particularly effective as propaganda because visual arts can get across a message very, very quickly. You can look at a piece and immediately know what the message is that the original patron is trying to get across. And sometimes that's the hard part of art history is trying to put it in a context where we can understand what it originally would have meant and why it originally would have been created.